Hi, live from Marco's studio, almost in Princeton, and um, we have this com ongoing conversation with uh, Professor Joshua Clayton of NYU uh, about cryptocurrency, blockchain, and all that's happening um, that is new. And for me, it's a conversation that harkens back to uh, my conversations with my father, uh, who was a scientist with Bad Labs, uh, even in the 70s, uh, we had many things happening in uh, technology and art, um, and we, we go into that <coughs> as well. Um, my work continues. I have a December show at Highline 9 coming up, opens December 2nd and, and goes through the end of the month. So uh, please check it out. Um, I'll put some info uh, at the end. And this show is called Resonance, V-Sonance, and uh, it really is a way uh, to look forward into 2022, um, into a new season, uh, to bring back um, community hope uh, that, that art can bring uh, healing uh, to to our communities, to bring our people together, and uh, this, this will particularly be an effort to do so. Uh, for those of you who are far away and can't uh, make it to New York City, to a beautiful high dine, um, um, I, I want to have uh, some things that uh, we can share with you as well um, through uh, our Shopify site and um, uh, perhaps share uh, in, in the experience of resonance moving forward. So here's my conversation with Joshua. And what are you teaching this semester? Um, two foundation courses, one called Introduction to Programming and one Intro to Web Design. Wow. And um, so essentially, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to, to fill this role of a kind of a mediator between the broader <laughs> university population okay. um, and trying to give them language for interacting um, with people and and computers. I see. Yeah, the literally a media medium <laughs> mediator. Exactly. <laughs> trying to trying to do that in the fullest sense. Yeah, in in in, in the uh, university that has quite a bit of media ecology legacy right yeah <laughs> yeah i i've actually when i was a grad student here i even took i took um i took a couple of classes in the media culture and communication wow. department where i th which i think you're referring to because yeah. that's where neil yeah, postman taught neil some postman. years ago yes yeah and um you know i remember read shoe shorts uh you know talk lectures about um everything from asha McLuhan to you know um Neil Postman and the, the at the time the word media ecology was you know brand new not many people were discussing it but now it's it's uh, it's much more well known uh, yeah yeah <laughs> that's that's amazing and well well thank you for uh, this uh, session which which was like two months ago I wanted to do and you know things kept on getting pushed back um, and I'm actually getting ready for my next show at High Line 9. Um, th thank you, by the way, for coming to see the September show. And, I really enjoyed uh, spending some time there. It was nice to uh, it was nice to to walk the High Line and yeah. then to to drop into the gallery and spend time. <laughs> I would, you know what, you know, what was my favorite thing about that space, Mako, is the is the way that the light comes in from yes. the top. Yes. You, there's, there's no substitute for natural light when yeah. you're dealing with paintings like yours. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we had an event on 9-11. We, we relaunched uh, Kintsugi Academy. And as I was, you know, and, and it was the 20th anniversary. Um, and and I, I must admit, you know, I had some psychological uh, fears about it because, you know, I, I I usually go down to ground zero, but I, I really felt like I, I couldn't that day. Mm. Um, and um, but as I was talking about my experience 20 years ago, you know, surviving 9-11, um, the light came in, you know, mm. and, and this this was the light that 
Daniel Diveskin, the master architect uh, planner for Ground Zero Design, uh, talked about that uh, exactly when the planes hit, you know, these uh, the, the shaft of light um, should come through the uh, buildings. Mm. And um, and when when I looked up at the light coming in, um, you know, it it, it cast this uh, halo <laughs> around the gallery, and it was it was uh, you know I, I I saw that as a sign of grace, but um, it, it is beautiful uh, light there. Yeah, that's um, that must have been a meaningful moment for everybody who was there. Yeah, it was, and uh, where we. Fortunately, uh, took videos of that morning uh, with several lectures um, about forgiveness and recon you know re reconciling the past to remember well, um, but but also to move forward. Um, and so we had several speakers address that issue, and um, it was very appropriate given that. The paintings themselves, you know, it's called uh, exhibit was called re dash remembrance and uh, trying to look at the past, um, hopefully with the lens of, you know, not just 20 years, but there's also 311, which was yeah. 10th year this year, uh, this year, as you know, and also a uh, pastor from Columbine High School who organized and invited me to be part of um, Columbine's 20th uh, commemoration came and spoke about that experience. So, so it, was, it was a heavy day, but you know, really important. And, um, and you know, it, it, it's kind of, um, I, I wanted to kind of catch up today and, and, and talk about um, all that's been happening in your, uh, journey with NFTs and blockchain, and uh, you know, new things that you're you're doing and discovering. And uh, uh, it seems it seems like only you know two months ago we were, uh, or even three months ago when we were beginning this conversation, um, you know, you were just uh, on the cusp of uh, trying to do something with this, and and now it turns out that you know things have uh, opened up a little bit. So. Uh, why, why don't we start from there? How, what, what's been happening <laughs> in the last uh, month or so? Yeah, th thanks, thanks for that invitation, Marco. I really appreciate it. And, and maybe uh, as, as, we, as we talk, maybe, maybe we'll find that we can even pick up on threads of, yeah. um, of some of what you just described, um, yeah. including, um, uh, including memory. Uh, because I feel like <laughs> our, our memories are pretty short these days. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't uh, often acknowledge or even take time to think back on the things that have happened two months ago, much less yes. ten years ago, right? Yeah. And so yeah. um, whether it's remembering uh, 311, 911, Columbine, or whether it's just um, remembering some way in which you were gifted with um, a person or an experience or, uh, or notice the way that the light was passing outside of your office or through the buildings uh, around one World Trade Center or something like that. Um, those are the kind of, uh, that's the kind of awareness maybe we're trying to cultivate in these, kind, in these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and your work uh, does that, right? I mean, you, you, you are trying to cast a framework for remembering and, and in, in a sense, honoring uh, of Japanese culture. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my years living in Japan um, were, were formative. Uh, I think that's, that's part of, um, part of the, the seeds of our friendship as well, Mako, yeah. which, I, which yeah. I deeply value. Um, in the in the yeah things have things have changed quite a bit in the past um, couple of months since we last spoke. Yeah. Uh, our first recorded conversation was kind of about my um, my initial entry into the NFT space and how I was trying to build on years of uh, generative or code based mm -hmm. art and um, and now finding this new outlet in blockchain technology as um, certainly a way of distributing work 
but maybe just as importantly, a new way of connecting with others who yeah. are doing similar work. And that was a theme of previous conversations is that yeah. this is not just about um, a new way of being able to sell and distribute art, although that's significant. It's also about connecting with others doing similar stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, define that term generative art for, for us, uh, for those of you, those, those viewers who may not know the history of that. This is one of the reasons that I've been so enjoying the conversations that we've been having, Mako, because if somebody were to ask you that, and I'm sure you've gotten that question dozens <laughs> yes. of times when you speak, um, if somebody were to ask you that, you would probably say something that was quite different. But yes. somehow we might actually arrive at the same point <laughs> at the end of that. I think so. I think so. At least that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Um, if somebody asked me in, in, in the kind of art circles that I move in, if somebody were yeah. to use the term generative art, mm -hmm. then that usually um, has something to do with a predefined set of instructions mm -hmm. that are often executed at the time you actually interact with or access the work, mm -hmm. which often results in work that's different every time you access it, or perhaps even responsive to some kind of user input so mm -hmm. that you don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, this means that the work is often code-based, although I would argue that it doesn't have to be code-based to be generative art. Yes. But there's ultimately, um, there's also, there's ultimately kind of a, 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 a releasing, there's a kind of yielding of full control over the process mm -hmm. um, because there is this algorithmic component that's also at play. And so yeah. like many even traditional creative uh, projects, you kind of put parameters or structures mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. place, and then you let it go and you see yeah. what happens. Yes. That's just a little bit more formalized in right. what's uh, often referred to as generative art these days. Yeah, so what's interesting, right, is, is that one of my pieces that was exhibited in September for Columbine High School had used silver, and silver tarnishes over time, and I intentionally used uh, silver that tarnished over 20 years yeah. in the painting, uh, which, which is this you know, uh, dark uh, block in the painting, which is all also silver. So 20 years from now, presumably a lot of this silver will continue to tarnish. So you know, we talked about how if we were to capture a digital image of that painting today, um, tomorrow it will be different. <laughs> you know, the painting will be different. The painting will continue to morph. And in some sense, like I, I just realized what, what you were saying, the definition of generative art can also apply to something that, that is, you know, more archaic than just computer art. But typically when people talk about generative art in digital terms today, it is algorithmic kind of a generation of new images that can morph out of. And it's 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 often unpredictable, right? The what what happens, uh, what comes out of that. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so this is the kind of work that I've been interested in for a while. And yeah. uh, so I started trying to um, mint and distribute some of this over yes. the summer. Um, and, you know, as somebody who was just kind of trying this for the first time, uh, there was a little bit of interest uh, to begin with. Yeah. Um, and, and I really appreciate <laughs> those, those <laughs> early collectors. Um, ah, who, amazing. Who could like, see some yeah. value in that. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, kind of remarkably, um, later, about kind of right around the end of the summer, um, I had minted some some new work and and put it out there. And as you often do with NFTs, you write about it often yeah. on Twitter. And then and then I woke up the next morning. <laughs> this is kind of funny because this just feels like. This almost feels cliche, but I woke up the next morning and everything was gone. So it wow. was literally like an overnight thing where the wow. night before I had all this work wow. that was available. And then the wow. next day, everything that I almost everything that I had available had had sold out, presumably because others who had taken an interest um, also yeah. let others yeah. know about it. And yeah. Yeah. as yeah. these things often go, sometimes that leads to a lot of interest suddenly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and so, I, so the, the, I think the most important thing to to acknowledge is that yeah. um, is that that was, of course, you know, um, interest in the work that I was doing, but also the fact that others supported it and yeah. promoted it. And yeah. you know, we you know, I keep coming back to this community dynamic mm -hmm. of um, what makes the NFT space healthy yeah. is when people are actually supporting one another, just like any creative yeah. environment right when people are actually saying check out this person's work it's so yeah. good i really yeah. appreciate what they're doing here and and so on and so on some pockets not all <laughs> but <Yeah>. some pockets <laughs> of the nft space really have that going on and yeah. and that's that's exciting right now and and it was a it was a huge boost for me in in my own practice as well yeah and that the ethos makes sense in in light of what um, a lot of you know scientists and researchers who who often will labor for years, right? That not not many people knowing what they're doing, and all of a sudden they they find something that connects um, in very broad terms. You know, my my father being a pure researcher talked about how you know you, you're not making you're not doing this to make money so like you know peer researchers are more interested in collaboration and sharing their ideas and um, you know sometimes foregoing uh, copywriting their research because they wanted to share you know and and to um, have have benefit benefit society and uh you know, maybe ten years later or whatever, but but that 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 ethos seems to be kind of very similar, right? Uh, that um, and unfortunately, in the transactional art world, that's the piece that's often missing is this sense of experimentation and play that is based on communal interests rather than just individual self-expression, you know. Yeah, and and I and I think you're uniquely sensitive to this as somebody who's tried to invest in people a lot over the years, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and you probably have um, a good amount of perspective about how institutions, organizations, yeah. or just like groups of people mm -hmm. uh, are more sustainable when there is that spirit of. Yeah mutual support and collaboration and and celebration that's yeah. that's nurtured over time rather than the competitive dynamic and and i think that that's especially needed in the nft space because you know market mentalities are encroaching <laughs> all yes. the time like how how can we yeah. make money off of this right. i right. think we're I, I don't know i think we're a little bit past the gold rush phase of nfts i could be wrong about that but uh, you know yeah. you, we're still seeing early you know adoption within corporate yes. uh america international corporations and stuff uh, and, and, countries, are jumping right? on. <laughs> and countries that uh have you know decided that this was you know the, their main I, whatever the financial identity but yeah. um you know i mean going back to what you were saying about um the integrity of you know community generative art community uh, versus the purely transactional reality that you know people are selling for millions of dollars these you know sport, sports items and memes yeah. and things like that and and so there's at the same time two things going on, you know, simultaneously, which which is very explosive on both ends. But you know, your your work has always been about um, finding a, a, a voice, uh, almost almost to create that uh, conversation and slowing down. And and so, you know, it, it that that's a really beautiful, uh, fruitful, um, you know place that you found yourself in i think thanks uh and i think that's maybe you know even as our media may differ mako i feel like that's an area of clear overlap between what we're trying to do yeah. you know when i went to your show um i think it was at the uh was it the end of october or 
or something uh, like that. End of September, yeah. Yeah, the end of September. Oh, actually, you, it continued until October, so you might have seen the October show. I don't know. They moved it. They moved oh, it. Oh, okay. Over. Yeah. But I specifically <laughs> knew that I needed to do that on a day where I didn't have a lot of other stuff going on because that's not like I didn't just want to pop in. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Thank because, you. Um, because you know, work like this is like, um, you know, I've said this before in our conversation, but I, I love the way that I'm also seeing poetry start to thrive yeah. in uh in the That's crypto true. art space because poetry yeah. is not something that you could just glance at right yeah. you yeah. you can't just like see it through your your yeah. feed or whatever you need to actually take some time to read it and that that requires an attentiveness yes. that some kinds of work that are that are just oriented toward getting your attention are, are not focused on yeah. so anyway um your work and, yeah. I, and i'm trying to do this in the same way uh, invites a kind of slowing down and a mm -hmm. contemplative posture that yeah. um, that maybe makes it the kind of work that could accompany mm -hmm. lament, remembrance, yeah. introspection, yeah. Um, yeah. awareness, the, you know, these kind of terms that uh, maybe sometimes are at odds with <laughs> with internet technology, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. why not try to carve out a space there anyway? Yeah. And, um, you know, that reminds me, uh, um, I think one of the greatest compliments that I've ever gotten for my shows was not from a critic or, you know, a collector, but it was somebody who wanted to have a memorial service at um, um, my show. She, she was not somebody who was religious, so uh, she asked on her dying days. I didn't know her. She was an AP reporter who came into my gallery in Chelsea, you know, often just to have a conversation with a gallery owner. But she said, you know, I would like to have my memorial service at, uh, you know, Fujimura's exhibit. And, and then two days later, my, my son and my daughter-in-law <laughs> got wedded uh, in, in the same space. Wow. And when I thought, you know, was telling this to a friend of mine, he said, you know, you can't imagine doing that with other contemporary artists like Damien Hurst or, you know, Jeff Koons, you know, <laughs> that, that would be quite, you know, off. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I thought that was like the greatest compliment I could ever get was was that you know if i always felt like my art um hopefully can hold the weight of life itself um that you know in some ways it reflects uh the, the, you know the journey uh both of joys and sadness but but that that it's at least honest to that right and and that you know and and in some ways when we think about even crypto art you know what is that threshold um you know when when do we cross that in you know from simply something that's vacuous let's say to something that is enduring right and and i i think those you know what what i have seen of artists especially in generative art space is it, it seems to be they're asking that question you know what is permanence well, you know what is temporary if it's temporary what what does that mean, you know, and, and being honest with that. So uh, it's, it's an interesting conversation because that's an area that overlaps with philosophy and, you know, aesthetics, right? That, that it seems to, you know, be beyond what's known as technology, but, but it's really not. Yeah, uh, maybe, I think historically, there has been an easier connection um, between generative art and performance than mm -hmm. uh, maybe there has been between, yeah. you know, even though it's, even though it's a kind of plastic medium and a visual um, interface, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes it's, it's harder to make the comparisons between certain forms of generative, generative art and painting than it is generative art and performance, because with performance, yeah. you actually are yeah. intentionally entering into an experience that is durational. And after that's over, you're left with the memory of yeah. that experience yeah. that and that you may be shared with others as well. Right. But that makes for a different equation when you're talking about what does it mean for this work to endure? Yeah. Although, <laughs> as an aside, um, I have had a lot of productive conversations about um, 
archiving digital work, which is another super relevant conversation for today. But yeah. I think from a conceptual standpoint, we're talking about yeah. uh, different something a little bit more akin to performance. That's a good, great point. I, I, I like that because I, I think it makes sense. You know, uh, you take contemporary dance uh, that's choreographed and, you know, how, how do you make Martha Graham dance enduring, right? And that, that's, that's been a question of, you know, not just filming it, but creating a language around uh, that kind of algorithm that is in you know embedded in choreography and and that that performance aspect is is something that I'm keenly interested in uh, partially because of the overlap with this community and relational aesthetics kind of way of connecting art, right? That's the painting to life. You know, what, what is the relationship? So so the next show in December called Resonance, RE-Sonance, is, is kind of actually focus on that, you know, what we just said, which is, you know, relationship between, I'm going to have this triptych uh, auto piece called See Beyond, S-E-A Beyond, and in a painting called Christmas 2020, mm. <laughs> which, which is uh, kind of a uh, uh, just titled that because I finished it on Christmas Day last year. But I thought it was kind of a pregnant uh, meaning, you know, with pan pandemic and what what Christmas may mean to a lot of different people to, you know, um, and or, or what it doesn't mean or whatever. And um, but I am going to be performing with my long-term uh, collaborator, Susie Barra, who, who is an amazing percussionist and composer and who composed music for Walking on Water, a uh, piece that I was shown in September show as well. But we're gonna, I'm going to be doing live painting at the space. Uh, we invited Stephen Proctor to come, a uh, friend of ours who has uh, dealt with immersive art and light projections. So he's going to be kind of framing this as an immersive experience. And then we'll be, uh, you know, since, since the small, uh, it, the area that, you know, live uh, audience can be is small, uh, because I'll be painting these fairly large canvases uh, or them um, as Susie is playing. Yeah. And then I'm going to base this performance on uh, the idea of Fumier. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this this is a, uh, uh, Fumier is a uh, stepping block that was, uh, you know, this torture instrument that was created in 16th century Japan to identify hidden Christians, the magistrates. Um, uh, commissioned a uh, bronze uh, sculptor. Uh, actually, he did Buddhistic images, but um, to create 20 of these. And okay. this is actually a facsimile of the original uh, made by Yusa Hagiwara in 16th century that Martin Scorsese used in the film Silence. This is act the actual uh, prop that wow. was used uh, when uh, Kichijiro first steps on on this uh, on, on the beach to betray his family. And as you can see, the images are kind of fantastic. You know, this is this is a um, kind of, I, I don't know if it was um, Italian image or something. There's a city of God behind, uh, you know, Pieta form mm. and um it's 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 because so many people have stepped on the surface it's worn smooth and and so the accursed object has now become this, this uh, object to behold and to mm. contemplate and and a friend of mine who's a, a remarkable probably one of the best portrait uh painter in japan who who has no relationship to Christianity, uh, he said to me that the Fumie is the most um, uh, accurate and important portrait of Christ hmm. that he knows in the world. Wow. Um, so so that that's kind of I'm gonna put the Fumie right in between the uh, the performance pieces and the, the pieces after the performance will be displayed as part of the exhibit uh, on the floor. Uh, which makes the pieces 
little bit vulnerable and you know and and uh, my bride Hajim was concerned about this and I said well that's the point <laughs> is that it it is you know Fumie is something that we stepped on and step on and we're used to seeing art on the wall and part of the people's reaction right to whether to try to navigate around it or you know whatever they end up doing I, I wanted to be part of the part of the performance yeah. of you know of movement and and so again this relates to the idea of resonance as connected to uh, relational aesthetics, which is a art concept about you know something about the viewer's response, um, and what we do in response to an artist is just as artful, <laughs> uh, perhaps as as the artist self. So um, you know, this, uh, I I wanted to see if you can come and at least um, at least observe what was going on so you know we can uh kind of think about brainstorm about what what might be possible out of that right and into uh you know this generative art space that's going to be a really uh that's going to be a powerful performance mako and uh, and it sounds like the subsequent or the accompanying exhibition too is is going to be <laughs> is going to be pretty interactive <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm hoping to, you know, first time I attempted to do this as an interactive uh, element, it, you know, adding it to my art, but I always been interested, as you know, um, you know, we've done conferences and gatherings, right, uh, surrounding a theme or trying to help people understand, you know, bridge the gap between art and faith or just art or just faith, you know, just whatever that may be, the gap may be, we wanted to kind of, you know, bring that to light and, and help people to navigate in that space. And, and it wasn't, you know, um, too long that I realized, you know, this this is just as much of the artwork. It wasn't mine. It was collaborative, mm. uh, and it, hopefully, it was you know in, involving uh, God's design, you know, in it. But but um, you know, uh, I I felt like that is part of the art that we don't talk about, and yet yet you know, people who are non-religious, right? People who uh, talk about art in very Gen general terms, they are aware of that space and the space that is birthed by someone trying to communicate and the gap between that, you know, um, artist and, and the audience is something that is certainly, of, you know, enormous interest in terms of media ecology, because that's what, you know, Marshall McLuhan was talking about when, when he said medium is the message, you know, it, it, it's that substance, right? That the invisible thread the, between people and, and art or performer and, and the audience it, is something that, that is so interesting and intangible and hard to, you know, figure out. And yet perhaps that is the nature of art, you know, and, and now with technology, we assume that just as we are speaking on Zoom and recording this, right, that 100% that, that you know, information is being communicated, but we know that's not true, right? So, so there, there's that kind of a pretense of digital, uh, media um, to communicate and 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 the gap between what you're intending to do and what is received as well. Yeah, and and to play with that gap too, because there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot to do in that space of non-communication. Yeah. What you know, yeah. what's not happening, yeah. or for that matter. What are the ways in which um, we can leverage the medium? Yes. Um, that that it can't be even in real life because ultimately yeah. these are all um, these are all mediating technologies yeah. as we've talked about before whether it's it's uh, paint or mm -hmm. or a screen or something like that and there are some exactly. things that paint yeah. can do that digital media can't yes and there are some things that digital media can yes. do these days that that paint can't either and so if we have the um, if we have the 
the patience to to press into that space and to and to navigate and even to pull at its its limitations and its its possibilities then for me it's almost like my classes these days <laughs> yeah. my, my, one of my classes is in person and one of them is online this semester which is kind of an interesting dynamic because last wow. year it was all online yes. next semester i'm going to be all in person and it just wow. so happens that yeah. this fall semester i have one oh. class that meets in person and one class that meets online now i at the end of the day i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to go with the in-person class there's nothing quite like being together with people but it's not like i'm not using digital technologies while i'm together with the people as well right. like a projector right. um you know stuff like that yes. but there are also ways in which i appreciate forms of interaction that could only occur when we're meeting online yes. um whether it's you know the chat box or yes. other ways that we can yes. interact uh, with communication channels that yeah. aren't available, like, for example, to the quiet person in the back of the class who might, yeah. you know, yeah. who might uh, type in a question but isn't quite, uh, was, wasn't necessarily yeah. going to raise their hand and, yeah. and ask out loud something. So yeah. there yeah. are ways in which we can <laughs> connect with people yes. uh, using these different media. And so, I, you know, for me, just like you, Mako, um, have been uh, mastering your art and working with specific pigments and paints mm -hmm. and minerals for so long. And then starting uh, a decade or two ago, you started to explore digital video and you're looking yeah. at some other areas like blockchain tech for, for distribution yeah. of your work. Like, you know, I am constantly interested in how the work that I'm doing now also yeah. relates back to in-person performance, installation, Kind of stuff even though the nft space is so rich with possibility right now yeah. if it doesn't ultimately relate back to some embodied <laughs> interaction um then I, I i think we're we're missing something and i think that's maybe also part of what's missing from the the metaverse conversation yeah. that's yeah. happening yes. right now yes. <laughs> um it's not an either or thing it's not yeah. like in person or metaverse because these are both occupying they 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 coexist one kind yeah. of comes out of the other our in-person experience so deeply informs the way that we're going to create and interact in yeah. a virtual space as well um and it's the artists who really can get in there early to ask questions to challenge our assumptions about how stuff is supposed to work yeah. uh, and if the artists get there before the corporations i think it's going to be better <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that that's that's a really interesting topic to explore, Joshua. And I wonder, uh, do you have any resources that you recommend that people for anybody interested in kind of this in between space, right? I, I always say, you know, um, you know, pe people wonder like why why are you interested in technology and blockchain? And so I say, well, brush is a uh, brush is a technology. You know, and, and so I use technology all the time. Uh, it's just that it's, you know, it's from 16th century technology. Mm -hmm. So there's no, in my mind, there's no leap be, you know, between that and using, you know, blockchain technology to create something. But the question is, how do I create exactly what you're saying about um, something that, that speaks to the in-between space or, the, you know, spaces that, you know, perhaps technology is assumed to be able to uh, cover that has its limitations and you take advantage of the limitations or maybe there's, you know, like a chat room is not something that Zoom, you know, came up with, you know, they didn't design Zoom, they didn't create Zoom to have chat rooms, right? They created chat rooms because the Zoom, you know, yeah. kind of lend itself to chat rooms, right? And then the chat room became kind of its own thing, right? And in you know, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, in uh, in situ way that people can interact. And then we're discovering that actually that's very useful because you know, previous to having Zoom conversations, we didn't have a way to reach those students sitting in the back you know and and you know and or 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 in churches you know people send prayer requests you know which is absolutely fantastic right like in the, the people prayers of people like yeah. there, there are all these you know prayer requests coming in from facebook but why don't we do that all the time and, and things like that we're discovering 
So is there a way to think about this? Do you know of any good resources? Um, one, one example that I would give while I was thinking about that is, you know, uh, Pauline Oliveros, who Susie introduced me to her before she passed away at, uh, in, in uh, Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Technic Institute. Uh, she, she was uh, retired by, the, by that time, but she, she, you know, she always believed that machines have a soul. Right, and and this was in the seventies, you know, and eighties. Yeah, she she always talked about how music, that machine created, generated music, which is generative, you know, can have a dimension that cannot be just explained alone by machinery and algorithm, and and so so that 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 was intriguing to me. I when I when she talked about it, you know, very passionately actually that there was this person who invested her life uh, creating electronic music uh, and machine music, but she believed that it actually has a soul of its own. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally resonating with what you're saying and, yeah. and just also um, jotting down yeah, your yeah. notes. Uh, I, I feel like it. I feel like bringing up Pauline Oliveros is is so helpful yeah. right now. And I would add to that list uh, people like uh, Vera Molnar, um, Manfred Moore, uh, a lot of the folks in um, the Bauhaus, like Laszlo yeah. Mahalinaj, who okay. were exploring wow. who were exploring these things before it was cool to do so. Right. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, people like. Um, Vera Molnar and Manfred Moore, you know, they didn't even really get proper recognition until right. later wow. in their careers. In fact, there was even hostility that they were confronting mm. about like how they were using military technology for mm. creative process. And what does that have to do with art is, is almost like, it's wow. almost like if somebody, a person of faith, like a, a Christian came to you and it, mm. they were like, Marco, what is the what does the fumier have to do with painting <laughs> these days? Oh well, yeah, right, right. This is this is a perfect example of right that kind of interaction where this is an absolutely an accursed object that you know really Christians, especially in Japan, don't want to talk about, right? Yeah. And and yet, you know, Endo, uh, who wrote the book Silence, such a powerful book for me. Such a powerful book. Saw this and you know, realize that there, this was like a portal uh, entry point into so many things that we have been ignoring as, as a Catholic, uh, you know, and, and so he, as an artist, brings it out to the forefront of, you know, the public's uh, awareness. And so there's this kind of a relationship between what might be seen, you know, transgressive Mm -hmm. um, to whether it be technology's use, you know, to uh, however you see the history of that object, right, as accursed in some way. And, and we're, we're seeing kind of very similar things happening with the internet, right? People think, you know, well, Facebook and social media has all these problems, you know, and and so you know what what's the, what's the antidote or what's you know how do we live without it or whatever that may be, it's kind of the same point, right? And and but you know Rivera saying machines has a soul, well, it can be extended to any kind of objects or any kind of experience, whether whether it be. Uh, you know, negative, accursed history or not, or, yeah. or something that is positive even. Um, but but that, that brings us into a conversation about the mystery of, you know, an artist exploring that, 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 that kind of, again, in between space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this <laughs> and we could go in so many different directions. Yeah, right I home. just want to, you know what, I also just want to pause and, and say like, that I don't so, sometimes I like I have a lot of thoughts too on yeah. how to navigate that space, but yeah. I'm not always sure that my experience translates for others. So and and part yeah. of that is because I didn't grow up always with digital media. And, yeah. You know, right. you know, you and I didn't always have right. the internet 
as right. part of our being, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm so glad that we have the internet now. But, yeah. um, but I am also grateful that I grew up at a time where I didn't need to think always about social media. Yeah. I'm even grateful, for example, that I learned, you know, photography is, a, is an important yeah. part of my practice yeah. these days. Yeah. And I grew up with, uh, you know, a single lens reflex 35 millimeter <laughs> manual camera yes. that I learned to take pictures on before yeah. I bought my first digital camera and yeah. you know knew what it was to make yeah. pictures in rapid succession. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so like that, I feel like everybody who lives across cusps like that um, has a kind of wisdom from that transition. And so yeah. the wisdom that I bring in my generational shift is different from the wisdom of those who are coming after me and those who went before me as well. Yeah, and each case it can be different. Um, you know, I choose to use these archaic, uh, you know, materials, minerals, pulverized minerals from 16th century beyond Japan, but but it's it it doesn't mean that how I use it is is traditional at all, right? right? right. And and you know my my grandson was over the other day and he's playing with these fidgets now you know fidget yeah. uh, you know what they are uh, the spinners uh, right yeah the spinners yeah <laughs> and and they're completely somatic you know they're, they're, and you even have to draw the board yourself you know there, there's no <laughs> kit that comes with the board uh for trading those things and huh. and i found that fascinating you know like like children immersed in digital media growing up with iphones and now you know really that what is what they want is this tactile experience of you know uh pushing these plastic things you know <laughs> and, and uh but but so 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 i i think it but in but theo's um you know framework is completely different than you yours or mine so we we have to kind of acknowledge uh that gap as well yeah, in the 16th century, nobody was excited about how their silver was going <laughs> to deteriorate or rust yeah. over time because they were anticipating a new painting to come out of it, right? <laughs> well, actually, Japanese anticipated. Really? Uh, I, I, yeah, there's um, evidence that artisans uh, like Sotatsu knew that the river that they will paint with silver will tarnish and wow. will create these patterns, you know, and moon that was painted with silver will tarnish and will become black. And it was, I, I think it was a kind of a transgressive message um, to the people who were commissioning, you know, these shoguns and power base that was commissioning them that, you know, their life, uh, you know, they, even their power is tarnishing. Mm -hmm um but that's so good yes. <laughs> yeah oh, uh, that's radical may, may we all have that kind of relationship to both time and power right <laughs> well and and going back to the digital space and with blockchain technology while it is not you know materiality that's tarnishing right but but the fact that it doesn't tarnish Right, the fact that blockchain measures, you know, is permanent, right? In some way, we talked about bur burning, you know, the, 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 which is kind of yeah. a contradictory, paradoxical term, and yet there's a process yeah. that is acknowledged, right? As as burning process, and and which which is really interesting to think about. Yeah. Yeah, burning in in the um, in the ritualistic sense, yeah. um, and also burning being just to just for people watching who are are not familiar with this, burning being the process of essentially deleting, getting rid of, destroying a token that you've minted to the blockchain because mm -hmm. you don't want to have it out there anymore. That's right. uh, that's burning, right. and of course, there's so much. Um, there's so much mystical resonance with the process of burning, letting go, the phoenix, what rises out of that, what's left over. Yeah. You know, that, um, but it's yeah. cool to see to see these, uh, these analogs coming over. And I mean, these analogs have been with us so, so long. We always need like we always need these material refer re reference, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you were talking about this um, earlier with the the chat room and how we need this chat room. Um, because we need some of these kind of like metaphors that give us uh, what am what am I doing in this space? Yes. I mean, the whole concept of the desktop that we use yeah. on our computer, yeah. like yeah. folders and files. Yeah. Like the computer doesn't think in folders and files, <laughs> but 
at, at some point in the 20th century, office yeah. culture emerged in yeah. such a way that that's how we thought about organization mm -hmm. was in terms of folders and files. I don't know what office culture is going to be like in 21st century, but I'm not sure that we'll have those same icons representing and organizing everything that we do yeah. in the next hundred years. Yeah, and I wonder to what extent, right, this new medium of um, creating digital media and crypto art um, has so many areas of exploration and mystery that we don't, we don't even, we haven't even tapped into because the metaphor is old wineskin or old fashioned, yeah. right? We're, we're talking about ledgers, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, the, these, um, uh, you know, whether it be art even, you know, of, of saying, well, it's crypto art, but, but what is it, you know? <laughs> And, and poetry, like you, you introduced me to um, an artist who has, you know, poetic elements in her work, and and I, 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 I wonder, Sasha yeah, Sasha, incredible work, and and I think, you know, these are like almost like pioneering spirits that that is kind of meandering and discovering um, in in between spaces, yeah. and. And, and they may come up with terms that, you know, may be, you know, may, may seem uh, strange or even transgressive to us, but in a sense, they're kind of discovering some new world, you know, in, in ways that we, we don't fully understand. Because, you know, language, go, going back to the word generative, you know, the way I am introduced to generative is from Noam Chomsky, right? Because my father worked with Noam Chomsky when, when I was born in Boston. <laughs> and this is generative language, which linguistic, my father yeah. brought, yeah, linguistics uh, understanding, syntactic uh, generative language. Yeah. And, and that idea that, you know, though it's been controversial, that all people are born with certain, you know, generative uh, principles mm. embedded in their language, mm. is is fascinating because that also translates into machine language as well, and we assume that machine language corresponds to our categorization, right? Our understanding of, yeah. you know, how things work. Well, what if it doesn't? <laughs> you know, uh, it's not organic yet, but yeah. you know, there, there's this element of um, you know, and and I I can see why Pauline would say that there's so much about machine, even the rudimentary machine language that we don't understand, right? So there has to be some presence, a ghost, or some reality in there, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, this is so important because, you know, the ways that we use technology um, and uh, the the biases that are embedded in them are, are very real and yeah. it doesn't necessarily represent the way everybody thinks and works and yeah. plays and interacts. Um, and this is a problem. This is part of what it is to to rediscover technology, to reinvent it in ways mm -hmm. that are not um, that don't have quite as much of the the Western bias um, and the orientation that has, at least in uh, recent decades, been um, been unnecessarily male oriented as well. Yes. Like yes. the plural, the plurality of voices that yes. have informed technology over time and that use technology these days enrich the space in ways that, yes. as more folks. Uh, it's just like poetry on the blockchain, right? If there's more poetry on the blockchain, then that helps to enrich yeah. the other kinds of work that, you know, I'm not overtly criticizing work that is just, mm -hmm. um, that's that's uh, that's not necessarily contemplative that requires more time. It's not like there's not space mm -hmm. in art yeah. or the blockchain for work that doesn't um, require time to, to, in, to appreciate and to enjoy. But if we just stick with those most obvious manifestations of the technology, then we're missing out on so many other yeah. dimensions of it. Yeah. And this is why yeah. I like to be in the space. And I think that you are as well, because yeah. we want to be a part of guiding it to making yeah. it a more pluralistic, um, more nurturing place yeah. that welcomes people yeah. rather than yeah. just one 
you know, I think yeah. because this this always seems like it's on the cusp of that, rather than the blockchain or Web three in general, which is kind of how things appear to be moving, is one that is dictated by the five or so large corporations that have the most vested interests in its evolution. Yeah. Um, can can the web be for the people again? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, the, what you just said reminds me um, in relationship to Fumier, there's, there's the tea house idea, mm. right? The, um, you know, which is uh, Sanorikyu, who uh, was principally most important tea master, created these tea houses in, in the war, feudal war time, um, and made them like shrink slow, you know, smaller and smaller until it was just, a, um, you know, one tatami mat and a half, right, uh -huh. at the end. And, and the reason he was doing that was because he had to create a way to uh, experience peace and, you know, what we call shalom in, you know, in religious terms, I yeah. suppose, but, but that, that is more than just, you know, isolation from the conflict, but it is a generative space yeah. that creates peace. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you do that? The only way to do that is, is to have a communal way in language uh, that often uses silence you know and invitation and hospitality as as a way to talk about uh, what, what really matters and and so i feel like we're kind of in a similar place where you know we need to create tea houses you know um you know in in on zoom or you know in actuality in some cases i i consider like I, increasingly, I've been thinking about my exhibits as kind of a tea house. How how do you host, yeah. you know, sometimes physically, but if I, even if I'm not there, how do you host conversation that leads to generative living, you know, generative thinking and generative living, and and that seems to be part of certainly collaboration. Um, you know this conversation certainly, um, as well as you know, and, and we don't we don't really know the answer to that, or you know even even we I don't think we fully understand the tool and instrument that we're using in technology. But but nevertheless, it's it's an invitation, right, for people to come along and say, hey, you know, what about this, uh, this idea or this technology or this? Um, and, and so I, you know, I hope um, those who are listening uh, can jump in as well. And um, so, so, uh, you know, so I, I will invite you, I think it's going to be on a Sunday, because we need a quiet <laughs> time. And initially, we scheduled for Thursday, and we realized, like, oh, my gosh, Thursday in Chelsea is crazy. You know, there's going to be all sorts of things happening. <laughs> yeah. So we, we might do it on a quiet Sunday afternoon with Susie. So, so I'll let you know. But um, yeah, I, I would love to, uh, I'll, I'll get the, uh, uh, the resources that you mentioned and, and you know, post it here. But any uh, last, uh, last thoughts for this session? Any, any kind of thing that you're uh, thinking about? Um. I guess maybe a couple of things I'd, I'd wrap it up with. Like, it, I, I really like this idea of the tea house as a kind of sanctuary. Yeah. It also, it, it kind of is like a, a space that you can leave your yes. normal spaces of interaction for yes. so that you could actually think clearly again. And I think maybe that's, that's a common denominator between generations of of creative minds, of people who are interacting with this kind of stuff that we're talking about, is at what point during your day or your week or your year are you kind of leaving the regular spaces of interaction mm -hmm. to have a kind of consecrated space of more intimate, more um, yeah. vulnerable uh, kind of exchange yeah. as well. And if you don't have that, uh, then I don't think you could come back into the regular daily interaction with mm -hmm. a level of consciousness that allows you to, to be aware and even critical of, um, of, of, you know, of its, uh, of its possibilities and limitations. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, we'll, we'll end with that, the session, but uh, you know, I, I think that's, 
that's a rich vein you know we can explore historically and i i think if we if we think of new technology as as an opportunity to be able to amplify mm. you know the hospitality or intentional uh creation of third space you know um that's that's an intriguing concept um that i think you know in, in contrary to what people maybe these machinery of institutions you know would say like we we want to we want the bottom line you know to, to like facebook you know we have to get rich off of people's information you know whatever it is like um and um but really it's it's, it's an opportunity to create something um new that can be a third space um hospitality that that is generous and that that has integrity um and safety right so so those those are themes that i want to explore further um as as we go on so so we'll uh we'll do this again uh i, I keep wanting to have people jump in but you know at the same time i i treasure our conversation so much and i think i think people have said that this has like open you know thoughts and doors for them in terms of imagination so you know we'll, we'll just keep going <laughs> i i hope it does and yeah. and i appreciate anybody who's who's made it through this video thank you yeah. <laughs> for being with us as well today absolutely great to see you joshua thank peace you yeah peace Bye-bye.